imagine because they like to make sure that everybody gets to have some holiday spirit before we all leave for Thanksgiving. And here's why I'm bringing it up. Because the month of November is going to be moving fast. We're going to be going very quickly, guys. And when we start talking about moving fast, your stop game is due on the 18th. And that may seem a long way off, but it's really not. So if you're not working on compiling your stop game, please do that and, and get on the, on the ball with it. If you're having questions, if you're having difficulty, if you want to know what you're up to and something is not making sense, come and see me. If you're not meeting in your groups to, to put this together yet, I suggest getting together and getting it started. If you have questions about what is and what is not plagiarism, hit me up. I will gladly help you out. Guys, today we're going to be uh, continuing chapter 5. We really didn't start chapter 5 all that much because we had a guest speaker on Monday, but we're going to be hitting up chapter 5. After that, we're going to cover chapter 6, and we're going to have our second exam, and that's going to be on four chapters. It won't be any more difficult than your first exam. It's all multiple choice, true or false, or bonus questions based on current events. Our final is going to be based on a total, most likely three chapters, because we're running out of time, guys. Do you have a cumulative final in this class? You do not, so it's nothing to worry about. So I'm going to be asking you guys to help me out. We're going to be moving at a pretty good clip. I may also cover some material in an online format. Now, here's the deal. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. Well, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But in, in the, uh, let, me go, let me go back. Where was I? Where it was, it, we may cover some of this material in an online format, meaning that if you had a bad test grade for your first test, you take an online open book, open notes quiz, Get 100 on it, boost your test grade. Pretty sweet deal, right? So we're going to be covering a little bit of this material in an online format. I'll be giving you plenty of notice on that. I, it would look something like this. I'll give you a YouTube lecture, probably a half-hour lecture. You have the slides. You have your book. You have the exam. You do an open book, open notes quiz. You boost your test grade. Sound good? Okay. Guys, for anybody on uh, earlier this week, on Monday, to ask questions. If you ask questions of the speaker, email me your question so I can give you bonus points for being willing to speak up. Uh, each one of those questions is going to count for a bonus point on the next exam because you guys were willing to talk and engage with our, our speaker, and I appreciate that. Guys, uh, here's a question for you guys. I don't know if you've been following the news. How much is a Popeye's chicken sandwich worth? Anybody been following the news? What has happened? What happened? That's the not just a stabbing, a fatal stabbing. So we're going to sh show you a, a bit of, of news here to get had a separate line just for the sandwich because the sandwich demand is that high. Everybody wants to stand the sandwich. And apparently somebody tried to cut line. It turned into a fist fight, an altercation that spilled out into the street, which led to one guy stabbing another person to death because they got in line in front of them for a Popeye's chicken sandwich. Any reactions before I ask you some questions? Is a chicken sandwich really worth stabbing somebody over? I would hope not. I mean, this, I mean, don't get me wrong. My mouth waters when I look at this, this deep-fried bread and masterpiece. I, look, I want to grab a piece of it right now and take a bite out of it. But if one of you guys jumped in front of me for it, I wouldn't stab you to death for it. This is, this is like crazy to me. If you're Popeyes, how should you respond to this? What do you do if you're Popeyes and people are literally killing themselves to get your product? I mean, we like to say in, in terms of marketing speak, speak, yeah, people kill for this product. We don't want it to be literal. So if you're Popeyes, what do you do at this point? Any suggestions? Oh, please, guys, give, give these guys some help. If, you're, if, if Popeyes is asking you for help here in terms of what should we do next, what should they do next? Yes? Make your sandwich more efficient, I guess. Oh, yeah, I, I would hope. I would hope. What, what else should they do? So I'll hand back here. What else should they do? Nothing. Tell me why. So, so you're saying it's creating buzz. You know, it's creating buzz. Have we seen violent <coughs> scenarios before when people had a product they really wanted not enough of it to go around? Yes. Well, not a particular product, but Black Friday. Nothing brings out the spirit of the holiday season. Quite like people beating each other up for, uh, for for cheap merchandise. You're absolutely right. You guys, I don't know if you remember, 
when you were kids, Cabbage Patch Dolls weren't really a hot thing. In the 1980s, when the first Cabbage Patch Dolls came out, they actually released them right around Thanksgiving, because that's the start of the holiday shopping season. Mothers were punching other mothers in the face to get Cabbage Patch Kids for their children. I mean, it really brings home the meaning of the season. So companies oftentimes will create shortages, so they drive up demand. And Black Friday is a great example of this. Now, we're, most times we're not, not talking about fatalities. But Black Friday, for example, do they, they do door buster deals where the first 10 people will get a really sweet deal on a flat screen TV, for example. We oftentimes... Nicole Bauman, ladies and gentlemen. Excuse me one second, folks. Hey, everybody say good morning, Miss Nicole Bauman. Good morning, guys. And girl. Here we go. You're welcome. Say, say goodbye, Ms. Bauman. Okay. Guys, in terms of Black Friday, look, we're, let's pick up. This, this is going to be one of these days where nothing is going to go as planned. I can feel it right now. You ever have one of those days where it just feels like no matter how hard you try, you can't catch your body? What are you doing this day? Oh, I wish I could. I wish I could. I'm going to stare, sit here and stare at this chicken sandwich for a minute while I get my thoughts together. I think we're good. Okay. Guys, the reason that these companies will create scarcity is to create demand. For example, what's Nintendo's current hot game platform? The Switch. The Switch. They released it right around Thanksgiving the year it came out. There weren't enough Switches to meet demand. There was enough Switches to meet demand right around January. Because why? They pulled everybody's Christmas money, but retailers themselves also experienced something in January. What is that? Are people shopping like crazy in January or not? No, no everybody's broke. They, all, they spent all their money on Christmas. But yet, all those kids that didn't get the switch, all of a sudden they're saying to their parents, look, they have them at wherever, they have them at Walmart. They have them at whatever store they're shopping at, and all of a sudden the parents will find the money to get out and buy that switch the kid couldn't get for Christmas, and the retailers get a little boost in January. None of this is accidental. I do think Popeyes is creating a shortage on these. I don't think the Popeyes really thought anybody would actually kill somebody over a chicken sandwich. But we've seen it. We've seen it with other products. Air Jordans, when they came out, uh, cer certain versions of those have led to violence as well. So anybody else have any suggestions for Popeyes? What should they be doing at this point? If you were the owner of Popeyes, would you say something? I might go on national television and basically say, guys, take it easy. More of these are coming. You know, maybe we can we can calm this down a little bit. Saying nothing, I think, is a mistake. How many of you are marketing majors, by the way? Marketing folks, think about this one. If you were working for Popeyes, what would you tell the company to do? So, guys... We left off talking about business. You know, we're having a, a conversation about the lethality of chicken sandwiches to start our day and why I hate the movie Elf. But we're going to get into special content because that's what we do to really get your money for today. You've got multiple ways that you can own a business, guys. You have a sole proprietorship, which means you're the boss. You own everything. You are a sole proprietor. You can be a partner, which means you have more people to come into the business with you. And then you can be a corporation. Guys, which one of these sounds the biggest? Corporation, absolutely. Partnership means you have at least two people. Sole proprietorship means you got one person who's controlling the whole show. They all come with advantages and disadvantages, guys. In terms of a, of a sole proprietorship versus a corporation versus partnerships, who produces the biggest amount of income? Well, if you want to go by total receipts, uh, corporations absolutely make more money in terms of total receipts. Total businesses in the United States, uh, sole proprietorships account for about three quarters. So corporations don't, account, don't account for as much of total percentage of ownership, but overall, they make more money. So we've got more small businesses in terms of percentage of total businesses, but corporations generally make more money. Why is that, guys? Yes? Fires, 
where sheep only counts once. Yep. Percent of the business, and that's every gas station in in a northern PA that North Carolina. Exactly. So obviously, they're going to more money and more time with their gas station. Exact mundo. If I have a small online shop, I, st I count as having my own business. I'm a sole proprietor. But there's no way I can operate at a scale of Amazon or Dick's Sporting Goods or a company that size. So even though the larger percentage of businesses in the United States are small businesses, either partnerships or, or sole proprietorships, and look at this guy, 72% are so, sole proprietorships, corporations still count for more receipts. When we say receipts, what do I mean by that term? If anybody's an accounting major, what do I mean by receipts? Any idea? That means total money, total revenue. Doesn't mean necessarily profit. It means how much money am I pulling in? If I'm a big company, I have a bigger reach. Well, let me ask you guys. Don't even worry about what's on the screen. If you guys had your own businesses, what are the big advantages to being a sole proprietor? Yes. Yeah, who here, by the way, ever sees themselves being their own boss? Yeah, I, I like that part of my life, the things I get to do. Where I run my own show. What's another advantage of being a sole proprietor? Yes. Uh, you own your business number one. So if you own your business line, if you're trying to that business, you can do it as your own. Yeah, you can operate under your own name. From this side of the room, somebody here, <coughs> over here from this row, tell me something that's an advantage to owning a business yourself. What's an advantage of being a sole proprietor? You can keep the money or you can give it away. Anybody up here, what's one more advantage of being a sole proprietor? Yes? Tax advantages. We're going to talk about that. Very good. Guys, what are the disadvantages of being a sole proprietor? Yes? Yeah, you, you, you may be working for yourself a long time with no health insurance. Are there other disadvantages? Yes? You got it. If you either succeed or fail on your own merits, you can lose a lot. Is there another disadvantage? Yes? You normally have to pay more hours. You are working crazy, crazy hours to get that business going. What else is the disadvantage? Or just with the work with everybody, like you always have to work hard and you can't break up the holiday or anything. Absolutely right. When you take a holiday, the store's closed. A good friend of mine named Neil, wonderful human being, one of the most generous people I know, owns his own comic book shop in Altoona. If he wants to take his kids out for dinner, he's got to close the shop. When he's not working at the shop, he's not making money. It's a very difficult thing to do. So some of the disadvantages are that it can be very difficult. You're putting in long hours, and you basically can only go so far with one person. If you're going to be one person running the whole shop, it begins and ends with you. It's very tough to keep that going. And sometimes these things have what we refer to as a limited lifespan because a human being has a limited lifespan. We can only do it so long. Now check this out, though, guys. A lot of people who have kids and have family businesses, their kids end up not wanting to go into the business. If you ever decide you want to be a business owner, you might find somebody who will take you on as an heir apparent, even if you're not related to them. So if you work for us in an independent sole proprietorship, you can put yourself in a position to own that company one day. Good example. A friend of mine, a guy I went to school with, actually a fellow communications major, got a job working for his uncle's rigging company. And if I say a rigging company, if you've ever seen large pieces of, of equipment that get shipped, and you got to tie it down. It's a, it's a very significant business, something we don't think about as being glamorous. His uncle had kids that didn't have any interest in the business at all. So now he's the owner of a multi-million dollar rigging business because he was willing to put in the work and be there when somebody was ready to hand over the keys to the business. So, guys, in terms of the hours you put in, I mean, a lot of times, does anybody here have a family business in the family? Hey, mom, dad, who, who's, who's the main employees? My dad. How many hours do you work a week? A lot. Yeah. I mean, it's, it varies a lot, but typically he's there from like at least seven to almost eight. Like in the evening? Yeah. Yeah, and it, I bet even when he gets home sometimes it's hard to shut it off too. Yeah, he still works. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Anybody else have a family business? What, what kind of hours are your folks putting in? So it's crazy, isn't it? You never, even when you're off, you're not really off, are you? It's tough. Anybody else? I think I saw a hand here. Yeah. What kind of business? And so if they're not, if they're not operating, they're not making bank. So how many days a week is that place open? 
seven days a week. So you work a lot to be able to do this. If you are seeking work-life balance, the life of an entrepreneur might not be the life for you, at least in the short term. Now, guys, we also get into the idea of partnership. You can get into the idea of saying, we're going to pull somebody else in to help me out. Somebody else who's going to take on the liability. Somebody who is, is willing to help me shoulder the load. We, we could be equal partners in this thing. Or we could also be limited partners. Equal partners are like a marriage. We're going to talk a little bit about how this is like a marriage. You can lean on each other. You own things together. You share in the successes and the failures together. Well, we could get into what we refer to as a limited partnership, which means limited partners are saying, basically, I'll give some investment. I want to be a part of the company. I don't want to take as much of the risk. You can be a limited partner in a company as well. It's all how you write the paperwork. So if you have somebody who's a general partner, that means you have what we refer to as unlimited liability. That means if the company goes bankrupt and the bank comes after your assets, they can come after everybody's assets. What are some of the things a bank might come after if you can't pay your debts? Yes, your house, your, house, your car, your property, anything that's got liquid value. If you're a general partner, you have a vested interest in saying we better be responsible. Now, if you're a limited partner, you're one of these folks who, who basically would come in and say, I'm going to give you an investment, but on paper, on this contract, I'm a limited partner. Meaning, if things go south, you can't come after my property, you can't come after my house, all you can come after is any investments I might owe somebody personally. And you get what we refer to as limited liability in that case. Generally speaking, in a general partnership, just like a marriage, if you are in it to win it, you also could be in it to lose it as well. A couple other things, too. In terms of a master limited partnership and a limited liability partnership, if this were a course about teaching business, or teaching how to start a business, rather, we would go more into depth on these. But here's what I expect you to know. In a master limited partnership, it basically means that you are sort of taxed on paper like a corporation, meaning some people uh, will have no liability or very limited liability. And a limited liability partnership, that means everybody who's coming in is sort of acting like the company as well. I don't need to say these terms aren't important. They are. If you were starting a business, you'd want to know this stuff in depth. My biggest concern that you are taking away from this part of the conversation is the disadvantages and advantages of forming a partnership in the first place. With me so far, guys. So don't, don't worry about taking too many notes on this particular slide. It's there for your information. Well, what are some of the advantages, guys? If you, if you form a partnership with somebody, what's an advantage? Don't even worry about the slides. Tell me what's the advantage. I've got one of you. You're a sole proprietor, you have to work with. Yeah, if you need two people, many hands make life to work. What's another advantage of a partnership? Yes. More money. More money, especially upfront costs, for sure. Are there other advantages to partnerships? Yes. Uh, more idea. I, I love it, because like, if, if I ask everybody in this row, you guys would all have a different killer idea for a business, and wouldn't it be great if we were all together? What are some of the disadvantages of partnerships, guys? Yes. Yeah, you got you to gotta share the money you're making, for sure. Is there another disadvantage to a partnership? Think about the Yes. Yeah, at that point, it truly does become like a marriage. You've got to share the decision making, yes. And if you're going to sell the business, it's hard to sell it. What a great observation. That's absolutely correct. If somebody wants out, uh, if you can't just sell the business. You've got to dissolve it. And it's hard to break it up. Guys, some of the other advantages I do want to mention there, too. In a partnership, you, you're still not paying taxes like you would in a corporation. That's still an advantage. You guys did a great job of identifying the advantages and the disadvantages. It really does come down to the fact that even though you are a partnership, you still are having, unless you've set it up on paper as an LLC, for example, or an LLP, you guys have unlimited liability. Here's my question, guys. If you're thinking about life in general, you know, you're looking for that one in your life. What are things you look for in a partner? Yes. Accountability. Tell me more about that. Because I love it. Yeah, so you can count on them to be honest with you, tell you the truth, and be accountable for their own actions, too. What else would you look for in a partner? Yes. Tell me more about that. Yeah, 
saying we have no idea what happened to the company or anything like that. When you think of a company where maybe one a partner uh, did not agree with the worldview of the other partners, I'm thinking about a company that started small and became huge. They made a movie about it. Give me a hint. Yes. Yes, what happened? So the people that made it, the two founders, they literally were the McDonald's brothers. Yeah, yeah. They didn't want to give them the pitch. They didn't want to go see everything, keep the standards high, and then someone that ended up selling or ended up wanting to be a part of it got a part of it, and then took like complete control of the place and just started making the McDonald's everywhere to keep keep the standards high. That's a fantastic analysis. The McDonald's brothers wanted a small burger joint. They wanted to have quality control. They wanted to have physical control over all this stuff. And Ray Kroc, who, by the way, is from Pittsburgh, basically said, you guys have a great idea. Your production line is amazing. We're going to franchise this all over the country. He basically took their business and ran with it. And if, has anybody here ever seen the movie The Founder? Great movie, right? Did the McDonald's brothers get screwed? At the end, they ended up with, with very little for their effort, and these guys died living in obscurity while the Ray Kroc basically ruled the world. And I'm not saying it's that cut and dry. Anytime you see a movie, it's always a dramatization. There's always more to it than the movie. I, uh, I'm going to ask you guys a question. If I made it an extra credit kind of thing, <coughs> how many of you would be interested in doing a screening of The Founder, seeing the story about McDonald's? We have some interest there? I'll bring up the idea. We'll see if, if we can make the time work for everybody. I'd like you guys to see that movie. But let's go back. What, what else are you looking for in a partner? What else? And think about companies. Think about life. What makes for a good partner? Yes. Loyalty. Oh, yeah, tell me more about that. Um, it's like just someone who's like right there for you. Yeah, somebody's got your back, right? We saw a hand here. What, what, what would you look for in a partner? Tell me more. Are you, are you like uh, cookies and cream or oil and water? Cookies and cream is good. Oil and water is not good at all. Guys, there's a lot of analogies. I know I make marriage jokes in here all the time because it's low hanging fruit. If you're a middle aged man, you got to make jokes about your marriage. Or if some, some people think something's wrong with you, you can talk positively about it all the time. But the bottom line in marriage, and I hope you guys will learn this in business, complementary strengths are good things. My wife is very good at many things that I am not. For example, my wife is one of these people who will light up a room with her warmth. She can give anybody a hug. She can cheer up anybody in her day. I tend to be much more functional than that. However, my wife's a terrible planner. I actually planned our wedding at, because she just gave up. She could not get, get her, her, her mind around it. I'm good at cleaning the house. She's not. She's excellent at cooking. And believe me, I barely made it through a home act. So if you get a partner who you can lean on, you got a good thing going here. When you are looking for a business partner or you're looking for a spouse, don't look for somebody just like you. Look for somebody who can complement your strengths and your weaknesses. That's what makes a good partner. Because here's the thing. Business and marriage are both a lot of work. They're the two hardest things you will ever do. Keeping a business operating and keeping a marriage operating. Very difficult stuff. So, guys, questions you should be asking if you're getting into business. Again, do you have the same goals? Do you, do you feel the same? I love the, the point about morality. Do we have the same world? Uh, are, we, are, are we trustworthy? Can we survive difficult situations together? And here's a big one, guys. Can you be honest to the point where you're being brutally and critically honest with somebody? Here's the thing. None of us like to hear criticism. It's not fun for somebody to say, you're doing this wrong. If you're with a good partner, that person can tell you how to do these things in a way that will make you better. That's the important thing to realize about a partnership. Before we go on to corporations, because we're moving at a good clip today, guys, I would love to get a question or comment from somewhere in the room. Sir. Oh, that's a good question. I Honestly, I've never been through that process personally myself, but I, would, I imagine it would be uh, a standard contract, something we, we outlined the, the terms of the agreement. And here's the thing, in the United States, uh, contracts themselves can be pretty easily binding. Now, here's the thing. If you're a sole proprietor, let's say you've already filed, you've got your tax ID number, all these things. And by the way, anybody here got stuff you can file for a business in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania very easily. You can, 
you, they call it your tax ID number, also known as your EIN. I think at that point you probably would have to file with the, with the state to basically say you're going to form a uh, partnership or add somebody onto your company. Yes. Follow-up question: Can you uh, then It's all how you write it up. If, you, if you're writing up somebody as a limited partner, what you would have to do at that point is outline their terms of participation in your business. In other words, is this person simply an investor or are they actually taking an active role in the business? And, and the, the purpose behind that is if somebody's a limited partner and the company does something really wrong, they're not going to come after them to the extent they're going to come after the, the master partner. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you, so you can name a master partner and have like a general partner like not limited they're still active, but they're not as active. You can have a, a master in limited partnership. Uh, you can you can have somebody who is uh, an equal partner. It's all how you delineate it on paper. The, the trick, and one of, this does not constitute legal advice, but the trick is if on paper somebody looks like a limited partner, but they're getting an equal share of the profits and they're just protecting themselves with those words, that stuff would probably not stand up in an audit. Somebody's going to say, wait a minute, this person's making decisions. They make the equal shares of the profit. They need to be an equal partner, and they need to share in the liability. Yeah, good questions. We had a good question or comment from this side of the room. I would like a good question or comment from this side of the room, please. What would you like to ask? Yes, sir. Have you ever thought about running your own business? Well, you know, it's funny. My wife and I, uh, we actually run a nonprofit. We uh, we have a, a nonprofit called uh, Patch Together Incorporated. Yeah, I've definitely thought about doing my own business. Uh, I think probably when I finish my doctoral work, I'm going to start my own consulting firm to do some some business and not so much marketing, but more or less nonprofit kind of consultation. Um, I think in retirement, I would love to own my own guitar store or something like that, but I would do it on a low risk basis so that I, I wasn't really putting my livelihood into that. I, if I had started younger, I think it would have been awesome to own a guitar store. So what about you? Are you thinking about starting your own or just yeah. taking over the family? It's mainly going to be the family one, but I would also would like to see if I could start something like that. Any particular thing you're interested in? I like the burger like men's burger. So. It's a hot business right now. More more people more people are taking the look seriously these days. I think that's an awesome place to be. Good questions, guys. We're going to continue. We're going to continue when we start talking about corporations. A, a C corp, what we refer to C as a, a conventional corporation. It means that you've got people who own the company, and in a C corp, in a publicly traded C corp, who owns the company? Stockholders. Absolutely right. And so a corporation means that, for example, you've got people who can make decisions about the company who are other than, than owners of the company. For example, the board of directors in a publicly traded company can make the decisions, even though the stockholders technically own the company. Now, when you're in this particular arrangement, What's difficult about this? If you are the board of directors for a publicly traded company, who are you ultimately accountable to? So it's a, it's a stock traded company. Who are you accountable to if you're in the board of directors? Yeah, all the shareholders. Absolutely. Even though you can make decisions without their approval, what do they get to do every year? They get to vote to say, are you staying on the board or are you not? So we've also got some other kinds of corporations. Again, when I put these up here, they're for information purposes. If we were in an entrepreneurship class, we'd go far more into them. An alien corporation means if you've got a company, and it's not from Mars, it's from China or Japan or Russia. If we've got a company who basically is based somewhere else, but is doing business in the United States and, and occupying some kind of space here, we've got what we refer to as an alien corporation. Then we've got domestic corporations, which means it's a company that mainly operates in one state. For example, if, you, uh, if you're a corporation that operates mainly in Pennsylvania or Ohio, for example, you've got a domestic corporation. And then you've got what we refer to as foreign corporations. Now, that sounds like it means international. What that means, for example, we've got Sheets. Where is Sheets Corporation headquartered? Altoona, Pennsylvania. But they're doing business in other places, so they're, con they're te technically considered across state lines be a foreign corporation. Then we've got what we refer to as closed corporations, which do have stock. People own shares of stock, but it's not publicly traded. And then we've got open corporations, which can sell stock to anybody. So if you have a normal publicly traded company, you've got an open corporation. So then we've got some other types too. And again, guys, don't worry too much about these because these are for your information. 
we've got somebody who's a quasi-public corporation. The best example of a quasi-public corporation would be Sally Mae or Freddie Mac. What do both those companies sell? They sell loans. Yep, Sally Mae sells student loans. Freddie Mac sells mortgages. Both those groups are technically quasi-public corporations because they were started by the U.S. government, even though they act sort of like private corporations. Then we've got what we refer to as professional corporations. That means you're offering some kind of services. For example, if you're T. Rowe Price and you're selling financial services. Then we have nonprofit corporations. And those are, are corporations which exist to do benefit to the general good. They don't make money. St. Francis is, is technically a nonprofit company. We're a small company. We're not quite to the level of corporation, but a nonprofit. Penn State University is a great, a great example of a nonprofit corporation uh, and an a education setting. And then we have multinational corporations as well. Guys, some of the advantages of a corporation, let's say, for example, somebody at Amazon really screws up. Well, for that matter, somebody at Popeyes or McDonald's screws up. They're big companies. They're corporations. Is anybody at Popeyes probably going to go to jail because somebody stabbed somebody over a chicken sandwich? Probably not. If that were a sole proprietorship, that person who owns that, uh, that company, because Popeyes is a franchise there, if that were an independent store, for example, that person might be facing a civil lawsuit personally as the owner of that restaurant. So limited liability means the company uh, absorbs the liability, the individuals maybe don't as much. If you're a, a big corporation, you can get money to invest pretty easily. If you are not already a publicly traded company, how can you raise lots of money very quickly? Yes. Go public. You can you can go public. You can issue stock. You can, you can have a bond. Big corporations can move in ways that small companies cannot. For example, Amazon has decided they no longer want to be beholden to UPS and the United States Postal System to deliver their packages. So what are they doing? Yeah, what are they doing? Yeah, they're building their... I like, I like the preface that they're trying. They, are, they have a ways to go. But they're getting involved. They're saying, we're going to do that. We're going to do drone delivery. We're going to do it ourselves. I think Smith Myers is going to be doing drone deliveries of sandwiches anytime soon. I would say I would say probably not. That would be awesome. I mean, that would probably be a good idea to buy sandwiches and then the dollars for the I love that idea. Well, actually, it would have been awesome today. Like, when I'm sitting there staring at that chicken sandwich, I would, it would have been awesome if I could have pulled up my phone and said, you know what? Smith Myers, I know it's 9 in the morning, but I really like some fried chicken. Will you bring it here? And a drone would sweep in and bring the fried chicken right into this. That would be awesome. I love that idea. So in terms of uh, also big corporations can easily draw talent because everybody knows who IBM is. Everybody knows who Ford is. And you've also got some separation between ownership and management. Corporations are tough to set up, however. There's a lot of paperwork. And you get taxed twice. When I say you get taxed twice in a corporation, how do you get taxed twice? Yes. Exactly, Mundo. So, if you if you're paying out dividends, if the share is has made money, if your if your stock is appreciated, that's taxable income, as is the normal operating income of the operation. So, if Amazon's making money, they're paying taxes. And in addition, they're going to be paying taxes on their shares as well. By the way, since I mentioned Amazon, do we have any guesses in here? I would love to see. Last year, out of every ten dollars spent on the internet in the United States. How many of those ten dollars went to Amazon? Exactly right. What do you guys think it'll be at the end of this year? Do you think it'll hit five bucks? I, I'm going to guess. All right. Well, somebody write this down. Uh, I'm going to guess that we're going to see at the end of the year the predictions are going to be for five dollars and twenty-five cents out of every ten bucks spent in the United States are going to be in Amazon. We'll see when they put when they post the predictions for December because that'll be right at the end of our class. We'll see how close I came. But that's my prediction. It's also difficult to terminate a company because at that point you've got to break it up. You've got to sell the assets. You've got to give people what they have to do. And again, as we said before, if you have a corporation, the board of directors may say, we don't agree with what the shareholders want. If the shareholders, the stockholders don't like the board, they can vote them the hell out. Just like the elections. Yesterday was our local elections, and quite a few people did not get the results they were hoping for either. So let's talk about how this works, guys. Just as the old expression goes,
blank rolls downhill. Am I correct? What does that expression mean? Substitute the word blank for another one. What is that? What does that expression mean? Yes. Yeah. Anytime something goes wrong, if it starts at the top, it's going to have a trickle down effect on everybody. That's something nobody wants to be sitting underneath. So we've got the owners <laughs> and the, or the, the shareholders here who basically voted. And for every share of common stock they have, they get a vote. So they voted for the board of directors. We have all our officers. Great. These folks set the objectives for the company. That comes down to managers who ultimately supervise employees. So it all starts with the shareholders. But what it comes down to is if, if the company is not realizing the vision of the shareholders, the shareholders can decide they want to change the way things are going. Here's some examples there, guys. We like to talk about publicly traded companies. Publicly traded companies are a big deal. There are a lot of really big privately held companies in the United States. In fact, some of them were just here. If you went to mentorship day, we had a representative of Deloitte. Did anybody meet the gentleman from Deloitte while he was here? Guys, this is how good this corporation is doing. The giveaways from Deloitte, what they brought all of us instructors and members of the administration, they just gave us Yeti mugs. Like, what, what's a Yeti cost? Yeah, at, at least. I got a, in fact, I got a Deloitte Yeti mug up in my office, still in the wrapping. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll raffle that off again. Maybe we'll make that a prize or something. But Deloitte, publicly or privately held, right? Coke Industries. Who, what do the Coke brothers do? Anybody ever heard of the Cokes? They are in energy, they are in supply, they are in logistics. They are one of the biggest, and by the way, political advocacy too. If you want to know where big political money comes from, the Cokes are, are big into that. And we've got Cargill. If you're, if you're buying seed stock in the United States, you're buying a lot of it from Cargill, who is one of the largest corporations, the largest publicly held or privately held companies in the United States and in the world for that matter. m and Mars, still uh, privately held as well. So not all this stuff is publicly traded. Now, even the biggest companies, however, have really, really big screw-ups. Who are my video gamers in here? All right, have, you, have any of you guys ever heard of Atari? Have you ever played a vintage Atari console? The Atari 2600, man, that's, that's changed it for everything. I remember when I was, uh, when I was a little kid, was five or six, the first time I played an Atari. Now, if you can see the graphics on these things, they're terrible. I mean, these are, these are, you look at this stuff and say, wow, people actually play these things. The controller was a joystick with one button, literally. That was, that was your control for those things. But it was a really big deal because they brought video games to the home. Well, you couldn't kill Atari in the 80s. They were the biggest video game console out there. And then the movie E.T. happened. Anybody as a kid ever see the movie E.T.? Yeah, it's a classic, right? Well, they, Atari said, well, this is great. We're going to jump on this. We're going to merchandise. We're going to create a video game based on the movie. What they created was the worst video game ever made. Like, people hated this game. Atari had millions of copies of E.T. that they could literally not give away, and so they buried them in a, a New Mexico landfill. Somebody thought this was an urban legend until about two years ago. Somebody actually found it, and there literally was a stash of E.T. games buried, buried in the New Mexico desert. That's how bad it was. Coca-Cola, guys. Coca-Cola really screwed up. Uh, they decided, by the way, we have usually Coke or Pepsi people. How many in here would, would identify themselves as Coca-Cola people? Coca-Cola's formula has been around since the 1800s. It is like the de facto classic of soft drinks. Well, in the 80s, they decided, Coca-Cola Corporation decided to change their formula, and they came up with what they referred to as New Coke. They made it taste more like Pepsi. There were people who were so angry about this, they were writing letters to Coca-Cola, death threats, everything else. 77 days after the new Coke debuted, the president of the Coca-Cola company went on national television and apologized to the people of the United States for messing with Coca-Cola. That's brand power. And how about this, guys? Imagine if you're the person who worked for Blockbuster who passed on a partnership with Netflix in 2011. How much longer did Blockbuster last after not very long. Here's another one too, guys. Yes. <laughs> they, they sometimes bring it back. They, they call it Coke too. Yeah. I I don't know if they're still selling it, but they brought it back as Coke too and and New Coke and it's not good. I mean, it's not worth your time. It's like Crystal Pepsi. 
Has anybody experienced Crystal Pepsi? It's awful. It's it's if you took everything that people like about Pepsi and took it out of Pepsi, that's Crystal Pepsi. And this was a test market region for Crystal Pepsi. But I'm going to tell you about the what I, in my opinion, the biggest corporate screw up in all time. Guys, who's the biggest internet search engine? By a show of hands, how many of you use Google at least 20 times a day? Yeah, I, how many of you use it at least once a day? Yeah, we all use Google. Yahoo had a chance to buy Google for $3 billion and passed, said it was too expensive. How would you like to be the guy at Yahoo who made that decision? Where's Yahoo today? Who knows? Verizon owns them now. Because Yahoo basically has all but gone away. There's a few things like Yahoo Finance that still persist, but you can never predict how this stuff is going. Guys, in terms of, uh, of corporations, though, anybody can, can form a corporation. If you're a trucker, you can decide you're going to be a corporation instead of sole proprietorship. That can help you get limited liability. People like doctors, plumbers, all these companies. The biggest reason that we do this stuff is to limit our liability, unless you want to form a publicly traded company. Um, there's also tax benefits as well. You can write off more things uh, when you file for taxes, for example, when you file as a, a corporation. There's a lot of legacy companies in the United States that have corporations as well. I think what we're going to do, though, guys, because I want to make sure that we don't glaze over the differences between C and S corps and LLCs. I think at that point, we're going to go ahead and, and call it for the day and say we're going to pick it up on Friday. But, guys, I hope you have a wonderful day, and uh, I will see you before the week is out. Again, if you, if you ask a question on Monday, email me your question so I give you bonus points for it.